We are live. Welcome to another happy hour edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. We've got a, a great show for you today and, and I'm honored to have the guests that we have. But before we get into that, we'll give a, a little shout out to some of the things that we're doing at C-Lab, guys. If you've enjoyed any of this content that we've been sharing with you, we'd love you to come be a part of it. Check us out, www.joincelab.com. If you're interested in being on the podcast, if you have a great story or if you want to join us as an expert on one of our panels, you can uh, email Robert Freeman at Robert at joincelab.com. And then I'd also like to shout out our friends over at Cureleaf. They, uh, they sent me this badass t-shirt um, and some other cool stuff. And candidly, they, they sent more stuff than I could ever go through uh, in my lifetime. So we're going to take some of that and we're going we're gonna to send it your way. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to start doing some giveaways on the show. Um, we'll figure out how we're going to do that, but we're going to get some of this stuff into your hands. So I told you about 30 seconds ago that we have an awesome guest today. Now, a year ago, over a year ago, when I was getting into the cannabis industry, it was one of the first names that I heard. Um, for those of you who don't know, my foray into the cannabis industry was around events. And I can't really get into it right now, but eventually we'll get into that story. And I was told that you need to get involved with the Hoban Law Group. Uh, Bob Hoban is a, you know, a star in this space. And you know that's someone that you need to talk to. So I had reached out to his group. Um, I made an awesome friend in Halston and Halston, I have a feeling I'm going to butcher your last name, so I'm not going to bring it up. Uh, but Halston who works with Bob and I think is his chief marketing officer at this point has been one of my greatest friends in the industry. And through her, I was able to meet Bob's CEO. And, you know, one of the greatest feelings in the world was getting an email to an email account I don't use for business from Bob saying, I really like what you're doing. I would love for you to be a guest on my show and I'd like to be on your show. Um, that blew me away because I had not reached out to Bob. We hadn't really talked before. And just for someone who's sitting in his house while this pandemic's going on, doing these episodes, not knowing if we're getting any traction, uh, it meant a lot to me. So I already said who today's guest was, but we'll pretend as if I didn't. My guest today uh, in 2013, achieved the Martindale Hubble AV preeminent peer review rating for lawyers with the highest ethical standards. He's constantly known as a cannabis law trailblazer by the National Law Journal, one of Denver's top cannabis lawyers for the past decade. And he has been on CNN, featured in Rolling Stone, Forbes, Vice, been on MSNBC, been on Bloomberg. And for some reason, he wanted to come on our show today. Please welcome the founder and president of the Hoban Law Group, Bob Hoban. Well, thanks for, for having me, and, and uh, I, I, I reached out because I, I, I mean it sincerely. You, you, you're doing an excellent job of keeping folks connected, and I think we've all gotten used to, uh, to uh, modified lifestyles here, given uh, the COVID scenario around us. But certainly early on, uh, when uh, you know, a lot of us were tied to our computers on Zoom call after Zoom call, which has only gotten more intense, uh, I paid a lot of attention to what you guys were doing and uh, just sort of looking for that virtual connection to our cannabis community. And you've done an excellent job of that. So thanks for having me. No, I, I, it's an absolute honor to have you. And, you know, the unfortunate part is there's so much stuff that I would love to cover with you. So, you know, the unfortunate part is I do have a day job. So this is a second, this is kind of a side gig for me. So I don't have the time that I want to do research, but I typically will cram in and do a bunch of research the day of the podcast. And there's just so much stuff that you've gotten involved with. So let's kind of step back to the beginning of it all and how you got involved in cannabis and, and essentially how you became Bob Hoban, who has one of the largest cannabis networks and has been involved in so many different parts of the industry. You know, I, I, I think you got started in 2008. I saw you founded your, your law firm. Talk to me about the very beginning. And then I want to go all the way up to some of the talks that you've been talking on uh, more recently on industrial hemp, because I don't know too many experts on that. And that's something I'm very interested in. So let, let's take it back to the beginning and work our way forward. Yeah, no, that sounds like a plan. Uh, so I, I started out uh, practicing law at a, at a large regional uh, firm out of Denver. Um, and then uh, looked for a couple opportunities to split off, started my own practice. Um, and uh, by 2008, we were, uh, it was Hoban and Fiola. And we did, uh, began to do primarily uh, general counsel work. We worked for small and medium sized businesses. By 2009, we were working with cannabis companies. Now, how did that happen? Um, well, first of all, I, I've always 
uh, been interested in cannabis policy. It's something uh, that uh, it's always been been connected to uh, somehow, some way. Uh, I did tour uh, with the with the Grateful Dead and several iterations thereof uh, many times since then. So uh, uh, cannabis cool. is, is something I'm intimately familiar with. But as it relates to the uh, the industry itself, my mom was was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh, in 05. and uh, uh, she. I grew up in New Jersey. She was living in New Jersey, and I bought her a place in Colorado to come out. And uh, uh, as I saw the the regimen of opiates and other pills that she was uh, advised to take, and the toll it took on both her mood, her body, um, just day to day, um, I began to look for for other uh, alternatives. And um, Colorado had a cannabis program. It was uh, not dispensary, not commercial. It was simply a, a right for caregivers to provide marijuana to patients with certain conditions. And so I began to explore that. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, my mother wasn't going to smoke anything. Uh, we weren't going to make her cookies or brownies. That was not an experience that she would welcome. Um, so it began uh, to, to start to talk to caregivers, folks that were providing cannabis, mostly online uh, by way of connection. Sometimes you pick up the phone and you'd say, um, you know, uh, here's what I'm calling about. They'd say, meet me in the parking lot at 7-Eleven. Other times they'd say, uh, we've got some cookies, some tinctures, some oils. Why don't you try these things? Uh, your mother might find some relief. And uh, through that, began to work commercially with these folks. Uh, opened up some of the first dispensaries in Denver. Uh, not me as a business person, but as an advisor, as a lawyer. Um, and then from there, it just steamrolled. We did that in Colorado. We did it in Oregon and Washington and California and Massachusetts. Uh, and now we're, we're working uh, on these issues all over the world. So it's terribly exciting to be a part of. Um, and it's so great to see other folks that just, you know, believe in this, this industry so deeply and work so hard uh, and take on that risk. And whether it's a personal story like I have or just passion for the plant, um, you know, there's room for all of us. And that's my favorite part of doing what I do here is hearing the stories that have dragged people into this industry because you know, as a user myself for the past 10 years, it was something that was always like, just to have a conversation about it, you kind of had to feel somebody out. And, you know, it, it was very much like, you, do you do it? Are you kind of into it? You know, have you heard about it? And, and you basically would kind of pick up these bread trails to so realize that the person that you were talking to had used as well. Um, you know, hearing these stories about people like yourself that have family members and as unfortunate as it is, how much it helped them you know, I, I think that really exposes the the true side of this business. And I think there are folks like yourself that are out there that are really helping us fight that stigma. I mean, look at the success that you've had in the cannabis industry. And, you know, by no means do I see a Cheech and Chong poster on your wall or, or, or anything else like that. You know, nothing against Cheech and Chong, but, you know, you've built a, a substantial business and network around cannabis and it's incredible. Um, I, I love seeing people that are like you out there. So you started working with commercial cannabis companies and, you know, I, I guess that you were able to see what people were doing right, what people were doing wrong, just kind of as an advisor, did that lead you into helping shape some of the policy around cannabis? And did you start that in Colorado or did you get involved at the federal level? Because I know that, you know, beyond just working with companies, you're also brought in to help shape policy. Yeah. So, so, uh, Interestingly, though, you know, talk about right and wrong in the early days. And, and, and by the way, most markets, believe it or not, in, unfold the very same way. It doesn't matter if it's today with the barriers to entry and the strict regulations or, you know, eight, six, seven, eight years ago. They kind of unroll the same way um, in terms of the, the activist folks that have got, got us here to set the table for a commercial regulated enterprise, the government regulators, the government regs. There is a pattern to all of this state by state by state. And we began to notice that internationally. Um, and that's how we got into the policy world. But think about how far we've come, where in the early days of commercial cannabis in Colorado, with marijuana businesses, uh, they didn't want to put a contract in place. And I've, I've never been a criminal defense lawyer. I've never practiced criminal law of great admiration for criminal practitioners. But I've always been a transactional guy and a civil litigator. As I looked at the fact that 
my clients were going to enter into an agreement for a marijuana supply. I said, well, we should contract for that. And the other lawyer said, oh, heck no, we're not putting that in paper. That's a violation of our Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. And, you know, I understand the concept and frankly support that concept. It's a constitutional right. But you can't have a commercial regulated business if you don't have paper to back it up. And I think we've seen that come full circle. So that's one of the early lessons. But um, I began to teach at the University of Denver uh, around the end of 2010. I was brought in, uh, I did PhD coursework at the University of Colorado at Denver in their Graduate School for Public Affairs. Uh, I was very interested in, at the time, um, different policies that related to property rights. Um, and as cannabis uh, sort of entered into my life as a regulated commercial or, or legal concept, um, we began to, to teach courses, government regulations, but we put a specific bent on it that we studied cannabis regulations in different markets, Colorado, New Mexico at that point in time. How did they want to regulate it? What agency did they use? Was it ag? Was it public health? Was it the city? Was it the state? Where did the authority rest? So we began to study that. Um, then I started to teach an advocacy course, which was a public policy lobbying course, a fair amount of drafting for legislators uh, in Colorado for a number of years prior to that. So we looked at, well, how do you lobby and advocate in the cannabis context uh, for policy and regulation? In other words, once you legalize it, what happens next? Nobody was answering that question, by the way. Great organizations across the country were working hard to legalize marijuana in some form or fashion. But then when you legalized it, well, what happens? Is it just a criminal uh, exception? Or is there a commercial and regulated industry and there was a lot of work to be done? So the University of Denver took a flyer on me and began to uh, allow me to create courses. So I taught uh, 14 students per semester in a cannabis policy research practicum, and they were able to sort of choose their own adventure and work on projects um, that advance things. And we wrote articles together that got published in scholarly publications. Uh, I taught internationally, I took my students to Uruguay um, oh, right, wow. uh, right before it, it legalized cannabis and was became involved in that policy process. So working at the University of Denver caused me to think about things that way, but it also set the table for opportunities. And you'll never believe one lucky thing that happened. I was, I was doing some work in Costa Rica in 2014. And in early 2015, I was, it was in Uruguay teaching this course with my students. Uh, we co-taught a course with the Catholic University of uh, Uruguay and Montevideo. I walk into the legislative palace um, in this committee room and the person at the podium was a minister from, uh, from Costa Rica who I'd worked with two weeks prior. And I walk in with uh, 14 students in this very tight room um, and the speaker stops, looks at me and shakes his head and he says, Mr. Hoban, what, what are you doing here? He broke his Spanish to say that in English and everybody kind of looked. So that opened up a lot of doors for who is this guy? What does he know? And we just worked really, really hard to, you know, try to create those patterns and to create those options. Um, because, you know, again, it, it kind of happens similarly, state after state, country after country, county after county, although every state, every country kind of thinks it's their own thing, but the wheel is the wheel. Everybody's got one. Um, you don't have to reinvent it. That, that, that's absolutely incredible. And that sounds like one of the coolest courses in the history of college to take, not only because of the subject matter, but the fact that you're getting all these opportunities to visit Latin America and see how it's done in, in other countries with you personally. Um, you know, when you first started teaching that class, there probably wasn't too many, if any, courses on anything in cannabis. I know since time has passed, we've got some of the universities down here like FIU and I believe FAU that are starting to get into that coursework. But what was it like creating that from scratch? And, you know, what was the student body like that attended your class? Did you have to weed out people saying like, hey, this, this isn't a cultivation class. This is very much a, a law class. This is a policy class. This is on the professional side of it. I mean, I know those two things can intertwine, but I'm just really interested to know what that experience was like. Well, it, it kind of started in, in it, the, the, first, for the first year the courses were about government regulations and, and, and public policy uh, and public policy lobbying. So those courses, I featured cannabis, but it wasn't 100% ah. about cannabis. So you started to see the reaction from some of our students. And a lot of the students in, in my courses were um, students that attended college later in life. 
uh, or that were uh, you know coming back to school to pick up where they left off. So they had preconceived notions about cannabis. And when you began to talk about it in a way that we're not talking about you know smoking. Uh, get high, the whole enthusiast or culture around it. We're talking about how's the government going to make, uh, how are public policy makers going to make themselves comfortable and the public comfortable that this business should exist next to other businesses? That was the question. And they said, well, we never thought about that before. It was a drug. It was always perceived as this negative stigma thing. So at the beginning, people were very uncomfortable talking about it, even though we talked about it, you know, as openly and honestly as many of us talk about it today and as we're talking about it right now. Um, and then people started to get wind. Well, this course was about this. So more and more people, we'd fill up those courses very, very quickly. Uh, and people would come and they'd want to learn about it. So the marijuana side of thing, that was pretty focused. At the beginning, it was a shock, then it attracted people. It was hemp where I saw the most excitement. People had no idea what hemp was versus marijuana, whether it was a part of the plant, whether it was a different plant, whether it had different uses. And as we started to study the hemp side of things and the fact that you can use hemp for all these things beyond CBD, you know, plastics, fuels, all these things that we talk about, the so-called 50,000 uses of hemp, it opened people's eyes up. So people began to study that. They wrote about that. And I'm very proud to say I've got, I've got over two dozen students that work, uh, I'd say 40% of them in the, are in the hemp side of the industry and 60% of them are in the marijuana side of the industry uh, in, in really good jobs. And they got that fire and that passion, um, maybe not from me, but from the subject matter that I taught. No, that, so, you know, I, I kind of wanted to try to weave a story and everything else and eventually get there, but I'm just too damn excited to talk about it. You know, I, I've watched a few of the lectures that you've done on hemp and CBD, and I always love how you, you say, do we have a CBD industry or do we have an industrial hemp industry? You know, my opinion on the matter is that the people who started growing CBD or, or hemp for that matter, they saw the advantages in CBD. It was unknown. It was kind of like a, a cannabis light that could be shipped across state lines. It could be sold online. And to me, we're at a point where there are some really good companies that put out a quality product, but there are also the majority of people that are just phenomenal digital marketers and are able to get their product in front of more people and are riding a, a trend, if you will, right? when you know i spent a little bit of time in venture capital in this space and where i was really attracted to were products made from hemp um and to me it blows my mind that in 2020 with everybody growing as much hemp as we are that starbucks does not have a hemp straw yet and this is you know something that people will joke about within c labs that i bitch and moan about but it's 100 percent true it's 2020 and i have to use that crappy plastic or sorry paper straw that disintegrates in my drink and i've seen hemp straws i've seen them in starbucks green i don't know why why it's not more widely accepted and i'm really interested to see the type of industries that are going to emerge around hemp that's not having CBD extracted out of it. Um, you know, I actually, I, one of the quotes that I heard you say is that Henry Ford not only put out a car made of hemp, which I think I learned in the last year or two, but it also ran on hemp fuel. And that on the back of the $10 bill, there was a scene where somebody was processing hemp from a hemp farm. And, you know, all these things that hemp was weaved into America's culture I'm really interested to understand what's going to come of that and how far away we are from it. Yeah, I mean, many, many, many years ago, before uh, the the before marijuana was prohibited uh, in the late '30s, um, there was an article in uh, what was a very popular ma magazine at the time, Popular Mechanics, and it talked about hemp question mark the next billion dollar crop. So in other words, uh, they saw all of these technical and industrial uses that you've just alluded to, um, but it took us many, many, many years to get there. And I'm kind of a, a historian in that respect, I go out and I buy books and I try to find things on, on eBay that, you know, were people um, before Jack Herrer, for example, but after the 30s, were talking about hemp and they were all persuaded that hemp is going to you know, save the economy and be used for all of these great things. And it was just around the corner, but it wasn't until 2014 when we had that included in our hemp, our farm bill that allowed it to be grown here in the United States. So we knew about those things. So then when hemp became legal in certain states and it was legal in Colorado before the farm bill of 2014. So in 2012 is when Colorado made hemp legal as part of its adult use package. Hemp was, I wouldn't say buried in there because it wasn't hidden, but it was in there. Mm -hmm. 
And then folks began to say, well, look, the marijuana industry is so regulated right now that I can't qualify uh, to be a licensee or it costs too much. So to your point, it became sort of marijuana light. So they stole the extraction technologies, you know, $15,000 piece piece of machine here and there from the marijuana side of the industry. They began to grow industrial hemp, cultivate it before it pops above that 0.3% THC threshold, which, you know, that's a moving target these days with how you test that. Yeah. And then they'd extract the material and they put it out into the marketplace. So that's kind of how it began. How it began for me was uh, a couple companies out of San Diego that were tied together at the time. Hemp Meds, Canaway, uh, CV Sciences, Canavest were two, some of the first two large scale commercial providers of industrial hemp CBD products. And they're certainly still operating today and global in scope. But at the end of the day, you know, the question was, is this stuff legal? And if it is legal, can you help us devise a strategy for production and distribution? Um, and so that's where things began to steamroll. Now, to your point, do we have a hemp industry or a CBD industry? And I'd almost twist that around now and say, I think CBD has revealed itself not only to not be an industry, but to only be an ingredient. And that's okay. Yeah. That doesn't minimize it. It's an ingredient. It can be a high-grade API ingredient in pharmaceutical products. It can be a food and a supplement, although our FDA hasn't filled that void yet. We're working with the FDA, and we think that we'll have all those rules ready by 2021. But, you know, it's going to – the regulation by the FDA of CBD is not going to make everything clear where everybody's going to thrive. Unfortunately, it's going to be a big green light to all the folks standing on the sidelines, the institutional companies, the major Fortune 500 companies to come in and use hemp as an ingredient in every single one of their products. I just saw this morning that Colgate now puts out a toothpaste, but it's got hemp seed oil in it, not hemp extract, but hemp seed oil, which has always been legal. So it's sort of capitalizing on this hemp craze. Uh, and you know, hopefully maybe consumers don't know the difference between hemp seed oil and cannabis oil. Maybe they're trying to capitalize on that, but I think we'll see more and more and more of that with beverages. Uh, with CPG products, with products uh, in terms of just adding it as an ingredient. If you take melatonin for sleep, take this sleep aid with melatonin, but it's also got hip extract in it, which makes it that much better. I think that's how you'll start to see things. I, and I think we're seeing a lot of that now. And actually on that note, funny enough, we actually have a question from the audience and I don't do this often, but it's on the topic that you're talking about. Can you talk about CBG? I'd like to know more about it and if mixing it with CBD helps absorption or if there's more benefits. Absorption, not absorption. I can't speak, but I'm not sure if you can answer that question, but it is a question from the audience. Well, you're asking the wrong guy about technical things because I hear so many things from my clients every single day. But here's what I do know about CBG. CBG genetics are uh, in high demand this year for being planted, sort of moving away from high CBD genetics. Um, what's unique about CBG, uh, it's sometimes referred to as the mother of all cannabinoids, meaning that with a quote unquote simple lab process, you can convert CBG into any of the other cannabinoids, uh, CBD, uh, CBN, uh, so forth and so on, depending on what the market requires. So that's what I know about the technical elements of CBG. And there's people out there that are listening uh, or watching that know far more about that than I do. But it is in demand for those reasons. And it's being planted a lot more for those reasons. But I understand that it's the hard um, um, cannabinoid to isolate in the plant and to have uh, robust, high-yielding um, hemp plants that are high in CBG. Um, plus, then what is that? Are we going to see CBG on the cell shelves? Or are you going to sell CBG as a wholesale material to then convert into other cannabinoids? Or does CBG simply make its way into products as an ingredient, which uh, could be all of the above? But again, I focus on the cannabinoids as an ingredient. I think that's the smart way to build your business plan. Because if you think you're just going to be able to put a bottle out there that says CBD on it, and then it's going to sell amongst a bunch of competition, I think you're very much mistaken going forward. You have to figure out the niche and your supply chain. And by the way, realize who owns the shelf space in these stores. It's already owned. It's controlled by other companies. Go to those companies and make a deal with them. Don't always think that you have to build your own brand and sell it online. Although a lot of people have had a lot of success doing that. I think that's a great point, right? And, and I appreciate you answering the question on CBG uh, exponentially more than, than I know for sure. And I, I hope that was helpful to the people watching. 
Um, but I, I think you make an excellent point with, with CBD. And I, I make the joke very often that you'd be surprised how much you can learn from Shark Tank, right? So to your point, if you look at CBD as an ingredient, why can't you just come up with whatever the next best thing is with CBD in it and license that formula to some of the companies that own shelf space? That's an absolutely great idea than just trying to be one of another 10,000, 20,000 CBD companies that are white labeling from the original 500 that are doing it. So, you know, I can definitely see the advantages there. Um, on that note, how important is, is general population education? So, you know, I think we're fighting an uphill battle with federal legalization here because of the stigma that's been around for so long. I believe that CBD has helped us kind of peel back a little bit of that stigma. But to your point and what you just said is how are we going to look at CBG? Is it another ingredient? Is CBD something on its own? Is that another ingredient? Is cannabis itself an ingredient in a much larger pharmaceutical play or some kind of health play that eventually that we're going to see? Um, where, where, how do we get to a point where the research is available that we can actually have a proper education on this plant for people to make decisions? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an excellent point. Uh, the public needs to be educated about these materials. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think back to this story where uh, my dad had come out to visit from uh, the East Coast and um, we had gone out and, you know, he was golfing and his back was tinged and he says, uh, he got some ibuprofen. I said, I got something better for you. He says, no, 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 no. I know about you Colorado people. I don't want any of that. And I said, no, no, no. This is, this is not segue. This isn't going to, this is, this is CBD. You probably heard about it, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, and he tried it. He thought, it, you know, it was great and it worked very well for him. But at the end of the day, people are concerned. Am I going to fail a drug test? Is this going to, you know, get me high or just make me feel different? I don't want to lose that control. Shouldn't a doctor give this to me? I mean, these are questions that people ask all the time. And then that's coupled with the fact that the industry doesn't always do itself any favors. So while we have to educate the public as to what these non-psychoactive cannabinoids can do and how they work in combination with one another, we have to educate the industry, the existing industry, even more. The industry needs to understand where this thing is going, not because I choose it, not because any actors within the in industry choose it. It's just the natural evolution of where this industry is going. If you've studied the nutraceutical industry, the natural products industry, um, which evolved and was legislated under something at the federal level called the Deshay Act in the 90s, this is evolving the exact same way. You've never had an industry that put so many stimulants and depressants on the shelves um, in capsules than the nutraceuticals industry with no regulation. People were getting sick, people were getting ill, um, and, 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 and there was regulation that was coming. And it all settled down to the point where those things are generally isolated ingredients and added into other products to make those products better. So that's ultimately where this is going at a farmer grade, at a food and a supplement grade. And that's not because I say so, that's because that's just the way things have evolved and we've got other models to see that. When the FDA asserts themselves and creates final rules, you can be sure that that's the direction that this is going. And some people got mad that the FDA was referenced in the 2018 Farm Bill. But that's, it's like pretending that the FDA doesn't exist and then all of a sudden, by referring to it in the 2018 Farm Bill, then all of a sudden you're acknowledging that it exists. Every product for human consumption somehow, some way has to go through an FDA or state equivalent process for approval. That's just a fact. Um, whether it's approved or registered or simply notified, those things have to be done and you can't make claims. So the industry doesn't help itself by making claims, particularly in this COVID scenario. We've seen some salacious examples of where oh. people were making claims that this helps with COVID. And I'm not here to tell you that it doesn't, but that's not, that's not what you're supposed to put on a bottle or a website, right? Yeah. CBD may help with pain. It may help with all these other things that we know and there's scientific studies for. That still doesn't mean you could put it on your label or your website because you have to go through a rigorous clinical trial program to prove structure function or to prove that it's efficacious for a certain condition before you can ever represent that. So that's where I think education needs to focus right now, because if the industry doesn't adapt and adopt those principles, then existing actors are going to have a tough road ahead. Um, and I think that most of the folks are recognizing that and adapting as quickly as they can. 
Did, did you see, I, I think I read today, there was actually, there's an article I saw, and I forget where I saw it, but there was a, a group out of Canada that was saying that cannabis use curbs COVID-19 because by smoking cannabis or consuming cannabis, there's less receptors available for COVID. Um, it, honestly, it, it was crazy to me, and I didn't believe any of it, and, and I don't think I should yet, but I'm not sure if you saw that one. I think it came out today. I, I did see that. Uh, I saw that. And I also, but I do know that our National Institute of Health and the federal government has put together a task force to study this. Several of my clients are on that task force. They're looking at okay. both the anti-inflammatory properties. And I think what that article you're referring to said, and I'm not a science guy, so I'm going to butcher this. But uh, as I understand it, what happens is uh, COVID sort of hooks into um, your body through some sort of protein attachment whatever the heck that means scientifically. And that cannabinoids, CBD and THC in certain ratios have shown to sort of eliminate the ability for the coronavirus to attach its hooks to that protein. That, that's what I understand it to be, but don't take that to your doctor. Don't, don't, don't make any medical decisions based on that. <laughs> Uh, well, see, the beauty about this show so far, Bob, is we don't have like a, a producer or somebody who can Google this stuff and correct us. So until that happens, we can cite whatever we want and nobody's going to question us. So we can continue to do that. Um, you know, you had mentioned, you know, at the tail end of your, your, your discussion on CBD that, you know, there's a lot of bad players out there that are making claims that are, are not necessarily true. And that's kind of ruining it for the industry as a whole. I've mentioned on this show before, it's kind of my opinion that, you know, this pandemic has put a little bit of a spotlight on the cannabis industry because in most states where cannabis is legal, it's been deemed an essential business, right? And I have this feeling, and, and maybe it's just the crazy person in me, that that kind of gave the cannabis industry like a, hey, we've deemed you essential. We want you to operate. We want you to continue but we're watching you. We're watching you to make sure that you're going to follow the rules, that you're doing things right, that you're operating as an actual business. And I believe that as long as cannabis companies, uh, from the medical standpoint, point, from the recreational standpoint, do things the right way and you know continue to grow and hire people, which they are during this pandemic, that I'm hoping the public opinion on the cannabis industry as whole will start turning towards more positive. Do you think that this isn't being we are deemed essential, that this is an opportunity for the cannabis industry to kind of pull back the kimono and show everybody what it's really about? I think so. I mean, I think if you, if you are a, a business that's recognized as essential, and let's, by the way, let's, let's highlight that for a second. I know you've talked about that a lot, and we've seen lots of articles about that. We've gone from a gateway drug, gateway to essential in a relatively short period of time. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, across yeah. the country with different jurisdictions doing that. And the fact that it's here as a business that gets to operate during this pandemic, um, I think, and as long as, again, as long as there's not major problems with, uh, with any regulatory infractions that get highlighted and, and, and you know, sort of uh, sensationalized by the media, then the industry has done its best job to be a part of businesses that are deemed essential and to participate like the rest of, of businesses, shoulder to shoulder, getting us through this scenario. But I do think it creates an enormous opportunity for the cannabis industry as a whole. If you look at you know, the essential component, that's number one. Number two, you've got history. You know, as we look at coming out of the Great Depression, which took for a long, a long, long time, um, it was the elimination of the prohibition of alcohol that sort of created uh, economic drivers and new industry uh, in the United States. So that's a historical thing that we can look at to see where things are potentially going. And then last, I look at the, I focus in on the economic driver piece of it. We've got Mexico about to pass sweeping legislation. We've got Colombia that all of a sudden pivoted and allows for a domestic distribution program. We've got Brazil. Uh, between those three countries, that's 400 plus million people that are going to have access to cannabis by and through their nationalized healthcare system. We saw the president of Costa Rica two weeks ago, out of the blue, make an announcement that Canyamo, industrial hemp, is going to lead it out of the economic decline following the, the COVID scenario. So I think countries around the world are looking, are increasingly looking at this as an economic driver. And of course, if you focus on the economic driver and the regulations, then all of the other social justice 
components and the patient access components typically come with it. So it's not to the exclusion of those things, it's inclusive of all those things. And that's what's exciting as we come out of this thing. And you know, that's a bet that I would make. Um, I'm not big into the, uh, the public stocks in the Canadian, the Canadian stocks in the cannabis world. Um, although certainly people have made some money and lost some money in those and you can follow those. But I think the economic driver of creating jobs and have private investment and have government support with their healthcare systems on the back end uh, driving this as well. Um, what could possibly go wrong? Hey, man, I, I am 100% on board with that, you know, and, and you'd mentioned a few things that I, I would love to expand on in that response. You know, you'd mentioned that at the end of the Great Dep Depression, it was ending the prohibition of alcohol that kind of started the economic engine, right? Um, by no means am I an economist, and I'm assuming you'll make the same claim. But one of the things that I've always believed in the federal legalization of cannabis was to create jobs, right? And now that we're in the pandemic, and cannabis has been deemed essential, at least, you know, companies in the cannabis space are growing and they're hiring. And at a point in time where we're losing so many hospitality jobs and people are getting furloughed left and right, national chains are going under, the cannabis industry is growing and it's taking people in. And, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity there that certain people who have the stigma against our industry need to look further. And like you said, all these other countries, like, not only is the cannabis industry creating jobs and as much as I love Twitter and Microsoft and Google and all those guys that have grown and become huge tech companies, there's a minimal level of education and technical expertise you need to have to get those jobs, right? When Twitter goes into New York, they're buying office space and their desk jobs for the most part. But when a cannabis company comes in, or even if we went down the road to an industrial hemp, we're bringing back blue collar manufacturing jobs that the jobs that America has lost, uh, delivery and logistic jobs, manufacturing jobs, um, you know, warehouse based jobs. Do you think at some point in time, we have to just kind of drop the stigma on the product that this industry is being created around considering it's legal in what 37, 38 states, maybe more. And start looking at the potential job growth and opportunities and the fact that they're blue collar jobs and bring that back to this country. And then let's even take it a step further. And I think you and I are going to solve all the world's problems here. Should America look to be one of the first countries that truly becomes a cannabis economy and start looking at exporting to other countries? Like, should we take advantage of this like they did? You know, and again, I'm not an economist, but I believe at the end of World War II, we were a heavy manufacturing company and that's what threw us into being a world power. Should we look at repeating that? I mean, certainly, you know, especially during this, this, this COVID scenario, think about this for a moment. If you look at, you know, the Hemp for Victory campaigns back in the, uh, the, 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 the 40s where, um, hemp was encouraged to be grown uh, to pr produce uh, economic drivers and to create uniforms and military uh, um, uh, materials and the like. Um, I think that there should be a momentum and frankly I do see a momentum at the USDA they just don't know how to channel it because to your point even the hemp still has that stigma attached to it especially when hemp has primarily been driven by the development of the CBD industry but as we look to our neighbors at the north Canadians Canadians are exporting material um, our neighbors to the south are literally 60 to 75 days away from enacting legislation that will allow them to do the same. We have countries all over Latin America doing that. Um, and, you know, like it or not, American products still are revered worldwide, particularly if they're run through our FDA. So I do see a tremendous opportunity. We see uh, our trade deal that was announced at the end of 2019 which was much maligned in a lot of different ways politically. But one thing that's very good in there is that China, the world's leading hemp producer, has to buy enormous amounts of hemp from the United States. Not a lot of people knew that. That was a driver that was meant uh, to, to move this industry forward and move it forward beyond CBD to help create a plant that services multiple verticals to become commoditized. Uh, the other thing that we've seen is the fact that our food supply chain globally has been impacted and hemp grain, the protein therein is off the charts. 
uh, three tablespoons of, of hemp seeds contain more omega-3s, omega-6s, and protein than most other things in their natural state. And you know, to your point about why doesn't Starbucks use hemp plastic, why don't we see hemp seed uh, and hemp additives in you know, Jamba Juice and places like that? Uh, we will, but we're just not there yet because of the stigma. But those things create an opportunity for the United States farmers to produce a lot of material, grain in particular, that solves that protein deficiency, fills that also uh, that momentum that we've seen towards plant-based proteins. Um, I think hemp will begin to, to focus there. The problem is we went from zero to 500,000 acres in the United States, uh, at least in registered acres in four years, but the vast majority of that had been single purpose CBD only crops. You can't really do anything else with those crops except make CBD. The fiber is not particularly high quality because it's not long. They don't produce seeds typically. Um, and then the profile uh, of, of other components of the, uh, the plant are fairly narrow or eliminated because of the processing uh, and the, the fact that they would pulverize it. So looking at uh, hemp to be grown on a large scale and hemp even solves the THC dilemma. A lot of people don't understand that 2018 farm bill made THC that comes from hemp no longer a controlled substance. It doesn't mean you, can, you and I can make it in our garage and sell it, but it's no longer a controlled substance. What is it? There's, there's a deep, detailed legal answer to that. But my point is, if you grow thousands of acres of hemp, even at 0.3% THC, you get more than enough THC in an isolated format to service Pfizer or any other pharmaceutical companies. You get grain, you get fiber, you get herd, you get cellulose, lignin, and sugar, all of these things that service multiple industries. The USDA knows this stuff and they're working towards it. In fact, they just passed a hemp specific um, USDA bailout package a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and Congress of course is talking right now to bail out or at least make cannabis businesses eligible for the prior CARE Act funds. So I think that the federal government's beginning to realize that things are maybe not as rosy as they think coming out of this economically and that they're going to have to rely on plant uh, based economies and USDA hemp is probably uh, ground zero for all of that, let alone what we're doing in our great state um, marijuana related systems. But that's interesting. That's, I, I don't see a, system, a situation where we started exporting marijuana products right now, but I do believe we export a lot more industrial hemp than we've ever seen. Um, and that will begin to include THC. So then it begs the question, as an agricultural commodity, is hemp the answer to the, to the cannabis backbone globally, or does it need to be marijuana too? And everybody's got competing uh, opinions and all that stuff. Yeah, and I'll offer mine, even though you didn't ask. Um, <laughs> What's your <laughs> you know, opinion? I, I, I really want to know, I do. I, I would think long-term that adult use marijuana, um, not in a medicinal form, so what we're doing in Colorado, we're doing in California, at some point, is gonna be commoditized and it's gonna drive the prices down as it did in the black market for so long. I think, you know, you see these, these memes online where you take like a piece of iron and a piece of iron costs X, but if you make it into a horseshoe, it costs Y. If you make it into something else, it costs even more, right? I think the margins and everything else might be higher and the economic value might be higher in the industrial hemp materials because they're biodegradable and sustainable and, and frankly stronger than some of the materials that we're using now that maybe the long-term benefit is what we're not focusing on at all to your point the the hemp based products not cbd not thc not adult use and maybe not even medical cannabis right every country every state is going to be producing their own cannabis for consumption maybe we need to be the best supplier of the stuff that we make things out of because that's what we've always done in America. We make shit. I mean, I don't know that that would probably be my completely uneducated opinion on what we should do. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you on that. And you know, if you think about it too, um, yes, there's element, think about Canada for a second, Canada, uh, because it was the, you know, the first North American country really come out and say, we're going to legalize this under Trudeau. Um, and now all of a sudden it's relied on for its cannabis products for export, its marijuana oils, its marijuana flour, so forth and so on. Um, but that's all scientific. That's all done in farmer grade facilities. There's no, there's not a great history of Canadian cannabis, except maybe in the, the, the Northwest and in and around Vancouver and BC Bud. But as you look at the United States, there's so many pockets of historical great genetics, great growers, 
great marijuana related products, uh, flower uh, oils, so forth and so on. Um, why aren't we capitalizing on that, that expertise and sort of seizing that? Well, the answer, of course, is political, right? You know, let's look at somebody like Mitch McConnell. He's a great example. Mitch McConnell's been a champion for industrial hemp and sort of, at least early on, unbeknownst to him, a champion for CBD, although he's come around on that. But Mitch McConnell would not support marijuana exports, marijuana economy, because he has to draw that line in the sand for political reasons that we can guess, but you never really know what's going on in the guy's head or what causes a guy to do, take certain things so that he can get certain kinds of votes. Um, or maybe somebody, he really believes that, that this stuff is bad despite the science to the contrary. So at the end of the day, politics and policy, unfortunately, uh, drives those decisions. Hopefully the economic scenario is not so bad that we're forced to do that, um, but hopefully it's a nice balance between the economy needing help and the fact that we've got this talent, this history, this infrastructure, and we might as well participate in it because guess what? Mexico's next in line. And when Mexico starts exporting products that are high quality at a lower cost than Canada and joining that international supply chain, um, it might be hard for the U.S. to recover. Yeah, I mean, if, if we have it going on to the north of us and to the south of us and we're not doing it here, we're just sitting here on our thumbs battling whether we should do it or not, we've already lost and we're fighting behind the eight ball. I mean, at that point, you know, I come from a tech background. We're the Windows phone at that point. iPhone and Android took off. Good luck catching up, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We are, we're the, we might even be the, the big old Blackberry from back in the day or the Palm Pilot. But the point is, you know, it's, not a place you, it's not a place you want to be. If you have talent, you've got infrastructure, you see that it works, it creates revenue, it creates jobs. And by and large, folks in the industry are doing their best to comply with regulations that are strict on the marijuana side and that are evolving on the hemp side. Um, why wouldn't you exploit that for, at a minimum, political and economic gain, if not for all the good things that'll flow from. Yeah. You know, on, on that note, what's something that's always intrigued me, and this was brought up by a friend of mine one time, let's bring it back out from the international view into just the domestic view. Right now we've got, I, and I haven't looked up the numbers, I think it's what, 37 or 38 states that have some sort of legal marijuana program. Um, right now, each state operates within its own walls. You know, you can't cross borders with it or anything else. And at some point, we believe there's going to be federal legalization. At that point, are they opening up the borders? Is there going to be interstate commerce? And is there a fear that certain states that came out early and stuck their neck out to make something that was federally illegal, legal in the state, are they going to lose their industry to the Floridas and the Californias and the Colorados that have been doing it longer and frankly have a history around cannabis and they have tradition and that's where the best has historically come from? Well, first of all, politically and legally, anything can happen, right? We've got an election in November. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to get political at all, but it's a coin toss. I, I think everybody pretty much recognizes you're going to toss a quarter in the air and nothing that results in that election is going to surprise anybody based on the polling numbers and otherwise. So if Biden wins, does that mean that there's a, 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 a movement forward on cannabis legalization at the federal level? Well, his record doesn't particularly seem to indicate that he believes that's the case. In fact, it's more of a pharma model and a decriminalization model, which doesn't bode well, by the way, for our dispensary system across the United States. And then if you look at the Trump administration, there's been talk about, oh, medical's okay. We've seen some policy, you know, uh, once sessions sort of went away, uh, the rhetoric around marijuana and hemp has, uh, you know, in terms of it being uh, stigmatized and, and made illegal and it being enforced on, it's kind of gone away. So it's really anybody's guess what's going to happen at the federal level. Um, and I don't think it's likely that either way we'll see outright legalization immediately. I think what you'll begin to see, uh, and it's, there's a couple of things out there, I believe it's called the States Act, initially uh, drafted by um, our Senator here, Cory Gardner, Republican out of Colorado, uh, who's a very pragmatic politician, by the way. States' rights, jobs, economy. If marijuana gets him there, he's going to go for it. Um, and that's an interesting political position because that's direct opposite of someone like Hillary Clinton and someone like Joe Biden on the Democrat side. But again, those are just observations. I think that's the likely outcome is to say that states, that it's legal within, that have a robust regulatory system, 
marijuana that is, it will continue to be legal and it will no longer be a violation of federal law if those states have enacted laws um, that are, you know, meet these minimum uh, requirements that probably me uh, mimic the, uh, the Cole Memorandum uh, uh, that we, we once had and, and that was eliminated by Sessions. That's probably what the next step is, combined with some tax relief, um, combined with some FDA guidance. I think that's the next five to eight years of our federal policy future. Now that doesn't mean that states uh, won't exploit that. We've, talk, we've had talk of states, Oregon, for example, has signed uh, agreements with neighboring states. To, they haven't done it yet, but to say, we're gonna transport marijuana over our state lines, even though it's federally illegal because we entered into this compact with one another. You might see crafty ways like that happen in the meantime. You might see that federal policy, if that, what I predict will happen, happens, uh, evolve to the point where states do get crafty and begin to engage in interstate commerce before there's rules and regulations. But only time will tell. But does that mean Colorado and California and those states will have a leg up? Not necessarily, because the way the industry's evolved, it's terribly inefficient. There's not massive, you know, if, in a perfect world, you would grow a lot of cannabis outdoors um, and you would distribute it across the country into, uh, uh, into a distribution system. Uh, that would seem to be the most efficient way to grow it and distribute it so that, uh, it, but, but what we have is that replication of that system state by state by state by state. Now that's good because it creates more jobs and it puts it, uh, and when there's more jobs, that means there's more revenue. And when there's more revenue, the government tends to accept it more, but it's not mm -hmm. good for the efficiencies or the messaging across that. So um, I think that the efficiencies will mitigate the advantage that Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado have if there were to be some form of federal legalization. Bob, this has been an absolute awesome conversation and I can probably continue to, to have it with you for hours and hours, but I don't know if our audience has that kind of attention span. <laughs> um, we're, we're, getting to the, uh, we're getting to the bottom of the hour here. You know, you are everywhere and, and you have been on you know in so many so many panels and, and so many talks and there's so much information about you you've done so much good for this industry and have supported so many people i can't thank you enough for you know a reaching out to us and, and coming on this show and, and b just for all the work that you've done in the industry and and i'm glad that i i get to see it um and you've put together a hell of a team you know i've met brent and and, and and Halston and, and then also Didi and you've got great people working for you. And, you know, I can't thank you enough for that. Um, on that note, what do we have to look forward from, from Bob Hoban and the Hoban law group this year? Well, uh, we will, uh, we, we've just finalized a couple of details on, uh, we've been working with clients on our psychedelics practice. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. We've seen a lot of uh, understanding the legality, what would be FDA processes, capital raises and the like as it relates to a, a psychedelics uh, based business plan. Um, I'd also encourage folks to take a look, listen to, uh, to our podcast, The Hoban Minute, uh, which can be found on our website, hoban.law. And, and likewise, I'd love to have you on just to talk about uh, maybe continue this conversation. Uh, we've had thousands and thousands of listens in just the past uh, four to six weeks, uh, which has been really exciting for us and we try to get good guests and, and just talk about things the, the way we're talking about things here at a smart level, but understanding that if you understand the industry and you understand that we're all in this together and that there is a, a, a functioning cannabis community out there that really anything is possible, but you gotta, you gotta be smart, you gotta be deliberate as these things evolve. Um, so those are just some of the things that are coming down the pipeline and uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully, maybe not in the immediate future, but sometime soon getting back on an airplane. That is one of the things um, that I'm grateful to be home uh, with my family for the better part of the last two months. Uh, it's been wonderful with my teenagers in the house and my wife, but at the same time, I, I miss uh, getting out and visiting and traveling and uh, working with folks in, in different little pockets around the world. Uh, so hopefully I get out there soon. And, and uh, when I do, I, I threaten to come and visit you uh, in warm, sunny Florida. Oh, we, we would absolutely love if one of those airplanes brought you down here to South Florida and, and you came to a few C-Lab events. We'd be honored to have you. And you definitely have an open invitation when, when travel opens back up. Um, I highly recommend the Hoban Minute. Um, 
it's a great podcast. And I can tell you when I visited your office, I started looking at you guys putting together the studio and I'm like, Oh, I want that piece of equipment. I want that. I want that. And uh, I think the only thing we have the same is the microphones, but um, hopefully we will catch up to you. And I very much look forward to being on your show. Likewise. Thank you very much. And, and you're welcome. Uh, we'll get that done soon. And uh, Halston says hello as well. Very cool. Well, Bob, thank you so much. And thank you everybody at home for watching another episode of Elevate Your Grind. I am your host, Todd Rosales. I really thank you for joining me today. Um, for those of you that are interested in more of this content, we're going to start doing more members only events. We're actually hopefully going to start doing some more in person events coming up. If you want to be a part of C Lab, join us at www.joincelab.com. Stay tuned. We're going to go ahead and do that Cure Leaf giveaway over some of the next few episodes. So please be sure to watch. If you like what you saw here today, you can find us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for Elevate Your Grind. If you like watching the video, go to YouTube look for elevate your grind you can find us there and then finally we're always live every so often or you can find the recorded uh, episodes being broadcast at 4 20 p.m on mondays and thursdays on our facebook group at www.facebook.com slash business group this has probably been one of my favorite episodes of elevate your grind and we will see you next week thanks Doug.